Today I want to talk about Fatia Lesage, gravity, and electromagnetism, and in particular how they have the same problems and requirements associated with them. And first of all, when you consider two magnets, as the video shows, one magnet can push the other when they have a repulsive configuration. And this repulsion is being transmitted through the quantum field. And you also get feedback from where you're pushing, showing when you have twice the resistance when you're pushing two magnets simultaneously. So that tells us that we have a quantum field pressure, quantum field force, and this force must obey the inverse square law. And then B, we have Fatih Lesage gravity, which has a shadowing effect, where one body shadows another. When you have two bodies, this body shadows this body from forces coming this way, while this body shadows this body from forces coming that way. And that way there's reduced energy, a reduced force pushing them apart, so the bodies get pushed together. So once we have a force that obeys the inverse square law for electromagnetic theory, the electromagnetic force causes electrically neutral bodies to be pushed together by the Fatia Massage effect. Now what this means is the requirements and problems are the same. Gravity is electromagnetic. It has the same force responsible. This force obeys the inverse square law and its proportional mass. So one of the first problems identified by Fatia was that atoms have to be mostly empty space, although he didn't notice atoms, the matter has to be mostly empty space. And he's right about that. He was one of the first to realize that, and he's right about it. And that means that particles can transmit through there. And then he had realized that the actual particles have to be much smaller than the matter. And once again, the quantum fluctuations can be much smaller than the matter, and much larger. But at the small end, it can be 10 to the minus 35 meters, the scale of the Planck length. Or, and you can compare that to, to 10 to the minus 30, 15 meters, the scale of protons. So that's 20 orders of magnitude smaller, which means that quantum pressure, the quantum field pressure is moving through objects quite easily. 20 orders of magnitude is huge. It means that as far as the quantum field goes, the material is hardly there. So it meets that condition. And then three, the quantum field must not heat objects. One of the major objections was in a kinetic type theory that if you had particles hitting the earth, for example, it would vaporize the earth because it transmit heat. Well, we know the Casimir exists, Casimir effect exists, we know that quantum fluctuations exist, and I'm not vaporized. So, this is not a thing. There's no heat problem. There never was a heat problem. And four, collisions must be inelastic. And the difference between elastic and inelastic is, in an elastic case, you would have a body and it would strike quantum fluctuations, those quantum fluctuations would hit the other side, and there would be no loss of energy. So, because there's a pressure differential here and here, we know that there is a loss of energy. The forces on the outer edge of the plates of the Casimir effect are not transmitted inside. So, we know from the Casimir effect that this condition is met, that collisions are inelastic. And then we know that the force must obey the inverse square law. And we know that from the electrical forces. We know the electrical forces obey the inverse square law. So the quantum field pressure necessary for the electrical forces that produces the Fatih and Lesage effect also obeys the inverse square law. And the way that occurs is that we have two different types of particles 
that make up the quantum field. We have some that are polarized like electron-positron pairs and some polarized like proton-antiproton pairs. And we know that an electron and an antiproton repel each other because they're both negative charge. But an electron and a proton repel each other to prevent them from just falling together and forming neutrons. If there wasn't a repulsion, then all the matter in space would be neutrons. And it's not. So there's some type of repulsion at a close range that overcomes the Coulomb attraction and prevents them from falling together. But that means an electron-positron and a proton-antiproton pair always repel each other, regardless of their orientation. And that produces a pressure force, a pressure and force, that obeys the inverse square law. The next one is that it must be proportional to mass. And here's a case where we know from the electric forces that it's, they're proportional to mass. When you calculate the force in order to get the acceleration, you have to have force times mass times acceleration. So you have to have the mass in the equation. So this force that causes electromagnetic acceleration is proportional to mass, meeting the fatty of Lesage requirement. And why that is, is because of the ratio of the sizes, that the quantum fluctuations can be so small that they just penetrate throughout the medium, throughout an object, because they're 20 orders of magnitude smaller, or up to 20 orders of magnitude smaller. Now another one is, is must be faster than light. So if you study classical theory, you know that Newtonian gravity requires a force be transmitted faster than light. What they often don't tell you under Maxwell's equations, the electric field, magnetic field, and the electric magnetic forces in general must be transmitted faster than light. If they don't, orbits would degrade and nothing would be stable because there'd be a delay and you'd be sending a signal from where you used to be instead of where you are. So in order to prevent this problem with gravity and electromagnetism, it must be faster than light. Now it's simple to figure out how this happens if you go to the de Broglie model of photons because photons are polarizable and they make rotating electric and magnetic fields they behave like a series of rotating dipoles. And Du Bois figured out these would be electron-positron pairs. And they must be quantum fluctuation electron-positron pairs to be massless. So you have these pairs that rotate 180 degrees each half wavelength, and that takes the speed of light. Well, polarization doesn't require that. Polarization can happen just a fraction of a degree. So you, you polarize much more quickly than you, than you transmit a photon. So polarization and mag magnetization are much faster than the speed of light. And the Van der Waals type forces also are much faster than the speed of light. Each particle interacts with each other as a dipole in a way that's much faster than speed of light. They don't have to rotate 180 degrees like they do in a photon. Then the resistance of the medium must not cause a drag. It must be constant. And this is another case where, well, if the Earth was under a drag, then we would have either fallen into the sun or been spun out in space, depending on how you calculate it. And so there's no drag on the Earth, no significant drag. And there's no drag on electrons, or electrons would fall into the protons. So this drag thing is just fiction. It's made up on a wrong-minded idea about the ether. And to the extent that we have drag, the quantum field causes the speed of light to be the speed of light. That's the drag, the speed of light limit. So, the next one is the medium must not gain energy. 
So one of the ideas was that these particles bounce off, and if it's inelastic, then that means the particles gaining energy. Well, we know from the Casimir effect, if quantum fluctuations gain energy, and also black body radiation, they would start doing black body radiation. You would see photons coming off because they're gaining energy, and that doesn't happen in the Casimir effect. So we know that this theory doesn't happen, at least not at low energy. We do know there's a dynamical Casimir effect that happens when objects are moving at very high velocities. At some, at some point, there's a point where they're moving so fast that the quantum fluctuations do gain energy, and then they do form photons. But generally, they don't lose energy that way, and not for these type of low-speed interactions. And then we have conservation of energy that's also related to that. So you have to have energy come someplace or go someplace so that if the quantum field gains energy, then you have to lose energy from the object. And in the case of dynamical Casimir effect, that's true. Um, but because there's no energy lost in the normal gravity, that's not a problem. And we can also see that quantum fluctuations always disappear and vanish. So if they don't produce a photon, then they haven't gained energy. They, they just go back to zero. And we also have to admit that there was a false assumption that the quantum field doesn't participate in the energy conservation equation. When it does, the quantum field can contribute energy or take away energy and it does so all the time, particularly in uh, beta decay interactions. And so we can't really think of the quantum field as being separate from the conservation energy problem. So the conservation energy problem is not a problem. Anyway, these are the 10 major problems with the fatih lasada theory. And as I've shown, if the medium is quantum fluctuations, and the force is the same force that causes acceleration of electromagnetism, then there isn't a problem. Then gravity simply emerges as an electromagnetic fatigue Lesage effect. And that's where the Newtonian part of gravity comes from. Well, I hope you enjoyed the video. And if you do, please like it, share it with your physicist friends, and subscribe to listen to my next ones. And then I have some books. I talk about this a little bit in my book, The Zero Point Universe, and talk about related problems in The 100 Greatest Lies in Physics. And then my latest book, The Particle Theory Book. And I'm a retired independent researcher, so if you buy one of my books, that helps me on retirement, and I appreciate that. And I'm sure you'll learn something about quantum field theory or particle theory. So thanks for watching.